I'm Nick, and you're watching Signal Ditch. On today's installment of the tube making series, I want to talk about a tool that I've decided to develop myself, and it's this lathe. Now you're probably familiar with lathes, whether they're engine lathes or wood lathes. A lathe is sort of a staple of the machine shop. Between a lathe and a vertical mill, you can fabricate just about any part that you want. But there is a type of lathe that you may not be familiar with, unless you have an interest in the field of scientific glass blowing, and that is, of course, the glass blowing lathe. Like most lathes, a glass blowing lathe holds a piece of material and turns it so that you can work on it. In our case, the material in question is glass tubing, and the reason that you want to rotate it is so that you can heat it evenly using a stationary torch. Now there are a few things that make a glass blowing lathe different from, say, a wood lathe or an engine lathe. One of those things is that the headstock has a very large through bore, which allows you to load a piece of glass tubing through the headstock, grip it in the chuck, and then put a blow hose on the back of that tubing so that you can apply pressure during glass blowing. The second thing that makes it stand out is the fact that the headstock and tailstock are locked together and rotate synchronously. Usually this is done using something like a spline shaft. This allows you to take two pieces of glass, heat them at the same time, and then by feeding the tailstock, you can attach the two pieces of glass together concentrically. In tube making specifically, this is incredibly handy for sealing the base of the tube to the rest of the envelope. Another feature you'll find on glass blowing lathes and not on other lathes is something called a fire carriage. Now this is sort of a tool stand. It's a carriage that rides on the waves between the headstock and the tailstock, and it can hold one or more torches or burners. In some cases, this is a Bunsen burner for annealing your work, or it could even be a ring burner or a crossfire torch for heating things up for sealing. There are other tools that you might attach to the ways or to the fire carriage itself, such as graphite molds for shaping glass envelopes, or diamond cutoff saws for cutting glass tubing. Glass lathes are largely employed in scientific glass blowing, where they're used to make pieces of glass apparatus for chemistry and biology labs. They come in all sorts of sizes, from teeny tiny benchtop units, all the way up to sort of gargantuan machines that have chucks that can hold 5 liter round bottom boiling flasks. Companies such as Litton and Heathway seem to be stalwarts in the industry, but there are hundreds of models of glass lathes made by dozens of manufacturers. Now, because these are specialized tools, they are pretty expensive, and they don't show up on the secondary market very often. There are some glass lathes that are less expensive than others, such as the Bethlehem lathes, which are sort of a minimum viable glass lathe. They're really stripped down and designed to be inexpensive. And of course, there is the option of building your own, and I'm certainly not the first person to undertake this. If you do a quick Google search for glass lathe, a ton of pictures are going to come up of people's DIY glass lathe projects. I looked at a lot of these projects, and I took inspiration both from them and from the commercial offerings to create my own design. Before we go over what I've built, let's go back to the CAD and I'll show you what the plan was. That way we can come back to the bench and I can show you how the plan has changed as I've started to put things together. All right, here we are in CAD. This is as far as I got with the design before I started actually ordering things and putting them together. Um, you can see I've done a little bit of branding work here. I'm calling this project Photon. Um, I stole the name and the diamond motif from a Russian tube factory that I'm pretty sure hasn't existed since the fall of the Soviet Union. <clears throat> this isn't their logo or anything. I don't think they ever superimposed their name onto uh, onto the diamond. The diamond was just sort of their trademark that they silkscreen on their tubes. Um, this is just me sort of riffing on mid-century design. So branding aside, this is the design for the lathe that I've settled on. And so I'm going to walk you through it and see if I can justify some of the decisions that I've made here. The headstock and the tailstock are identical. They're made out of uh, identical parts. They're not mirrored from each other. It's the tailstock is just the 
the headstock rotated around 180 degrees and, and stuck on the other side. Um, they have different panels on the front and back. So this one's got, you know, rotary encoder. This one has some switches and a little LCD screen. The main bodies of the stocks are built out of aluminum. They're, it's a U-shape sort of folded piece of aluminum that holds the two bearing blocks. And then um, those are made rigid by the application of these panels on the front, back and top. These panels, I'm going to try to get away with making these out of acrylic because I can I can make those on my laser cutter. But if that doesn't work out, if that proves not to be appropriate, then uh, yeah, I can just throw some aluminum panels on here. That won't be a big deal. So let's go around back and I will show you. I have taken the back panel off of the tailstock um, and you can see sort of how these things go inside. So I've stolen a few ideas from one particular glass lathe build that I found on YouTube. And the two major ideas that I stole from that were the use of these big bearing pillow blocks, as well as the use of stepper motors to synchronize the spindles on the headstock and tailstock, as opposed to sort of a more traditional route of connecting the two spindles through like a spline shaft underneath the two, like in the ways. I think both of those are, are really great ideas and I think that they work to sort of make the machine less expensive and more accessible overall. And also, uh, I think that there are some advantages, some hidden advantages to using stepper motors in this application that I'll talk about here in a minute. As you can see, uh, the inside of these things is really basic. These bearing blocks, these have a uh, two inch inner diameter. They are dirt cheap for the size bearing that they are. Traditionally, in this application, you might use something like a thin section roller bearing, maybe even a, a deep groove roller bearing. I cannot find an inexpensive source uh, for a bearing like that. Whereas these bearings in pillow blocks, these are used in industrial conveyors on all sorts of machinery. They're sold as replacements for those parts, and you can buy a set of two of these for something like $16. So there's $30. $32 worth of bearings in this thing, which is, I mean, if you wanted to do thin section bearings, there would be around $200 worth of bearings in this. So you save a lot of money. The only downside to these bearings, of course, is that they are not rated for very high speed. That's not an issue in this application. I mean, I think these things are rated up to uh, 1200 RPM, which is higher than you probably want this thing to spin anyway. Obviously, if this was an engine lathe or a wood lathe, that would wouldn't even come close to cutting the mustard. But in this application, I think it's it's just about perfect. Uh, the other downside, of course, is that they're they're rather large um, and heavy. But uh, honestly, the more stationary mass that I can get into this thing, the more stable it's going to be. So I have all the room in the world for these big uh, bearing blocks. So as I mentioned earlier, the spindles are synchronized by the use of stepper motors driving each spindle independently. Now, there are a couple ways that you could do that. You could either have a separate motor driver for each of the stepper motors and then feed them the same step signal so that they're theoretically always synchronized. You could feed them independent step signals and then you could use something like a quadrature encoder on the both of them to monitor them and actually use something like a PID loop to try to maintain the, the synchronization between the two. So if either of the motors missed a step, then you could try to compensate. I don't think that active synchronization is necessary here. I don't expect these NEMA 17 stepper motors to miss very many steps. We'll see. We'll have to experiment and find out. But um, my plan is is to do this sort of the lazy way and just to wire the two stepper motors in parallel with one another and drive them with a single stepper controller. Um, so the two motors should resist turning independently. The thing you're not gonna get with this setup is, uh, you know, if you had a PID loop and you were doing active synchronization, then you could reach up and grab one of these spindles and turn it and the other one would turn in response. With the two motors wired up in parallel, you're not gonna be able to do that. But uh, the way that I have decided to solve that problem is just to put uh, a rotary encoder on the end of the headstock here and then you can reach up and grab this knob and when you turn it the spindle will turn one to one with this knob so it's like you're grabbing the end of the of the headstock spindle here um, you just reach down here instead and I, I think that's a pretty reasonable solution to this problem we'll see if I can get used to it so the lathe is gonna have basically two modes when you turn on the power using the switch here um, if it's in start mode the spindles will spin and you will be able to adjust the spindle speed using this rotary encoder. And then in stop mode, you'll be able to manually turn these using this uh, same encoder sort of one-to-one -one with the 
with the spindle position. Over here on the tailstock, we have another rotary encoder, and this one uh, is labeled feed. Obviously, that controls this stepper motor here, which turns this ball screw, which will advance the tailstock forward and back. As you can see, everything is on linear bearings. These are SBR16 linear bearings and rails. The only reason that the headstock is on the same linear bearings as everything else is just to keep everything at the same height, sort of automatically. In reality, these bearings have a set screw in the side, and I will probably use those to lock the headstock in place. The headstock will contain all of the control and drive circuitry for the lathe. The only thing that won't be in here is the power supply. Uh, that'll be some sort of external off-the-shelf power supply, something like a Meanwell. To connect that drive circuitry to everything else on the lathe, I'm gonna use uh, these aviation connectors. They're inexpensive because they use them on 3D printers all the time, so they're pretty available, and I think you can buy like five packs of them on Amazon. We'll have one wire that connects the headstock to the tailstock. We'll have another wire that connects it to the uh, stepper motor on the end, the, the feed motor. And then we will have another aviation connector, which will be the power input from the power brick. Then I have these two uh, quarter inch TRS connectors, and these are going to be for foot pedals. Uh, in theory, one foot pedal is going to be to uh, turn the spindle on and off and the other foot pedal will control the feed of the tailstock. The function of those foot pedals is going to be programmable. To return to the actual spindle drive, you can see I have a NEMA 17 stepper motor in a stepper motor bracket and that is bolted to the bottom of the aluminum sort of scaffold here and then it drives the spindle using a custom 3D printed pulley that is attached to the spindle with set screws. And it drives that using just a GT2 belt. This belt is super cheap and accessible because again, this gets used on 3D printers all the time. In CAD, I drew this sort of perfectly sized belt, but in reality, this will probably be an oversized belt and then there's gonna be a spring-loaded idler pulley that will help tension this so that uh, it doesn't slip. The driving sort of design philosophy of the Photon Lathe is that I want it to be something you can assemble with off-the-shelf parts and basic hand tools. If you have access to a machine shop, the overall price of the project comes down because you're not shopping out things like the uh, aluminum here and the 3D printed parts. But if you don't have access to a machine shop, you can still order all of those parts and build this. Here we can take a closer look at the chuck. Now I stole a lot of this chuck design, again, from uh, someone else's uh, home build on YouTube. They had a little bit of a different mechanism. So all three of their chuck jaws had a pulley on them and then separate to all of that, the belt was tied to a ball screw and then the ball screw would pull on the belt. That worked really well for them and it allowed them to use a piece of open loop belt and then tension it and actually tie it together at the ball screw. In my case, I just attached a spur gear directly to one of the chuck jaws, and that spur gear is driven by a worm gear on this shaft that sits tangential to the spindle. In reality, I found that tensioning this belt is, is very tricky, and I actually don't trust um, this, this belt to hold tension, and I'll talk more about that when I show you the chuck that I've actually built. In holding with the design philosophy for the rest of the lathe, this chuck is designed primarily to be built out of flat and 3D printed parts. So all of the metal parts are flat because they are inexpensive to have cut by a service like Oshcut. And then anything that couldn't be made flat is designed to be 3D printed out of resin. Now it's yet to be seen whether these will actually hold up. I don't think that the mechanical forces will be much of a problem, but the heat is uh, sort of my primary concern. When you're using this lathe, you really shouldn't work right up on the chuck. Uh, on sort of a traditional glass lathe, you could do that. In this case, I'm working on sort of small, tubes, small envelopes. It's all going to be sort of small tubing that I can work on on the end of a piece of tubing way out here in between the two chucks. So hopefully neither of them have to get all that hot. You know, these plates are made out of aluminum, so they should do a pretty good job of sinking any heat that hits them. I thought about 
doing something crazy like using you know ceramic fasteners to bolt these to here or some sort of plastic that wouldn't transmit heat you know that was rated for a high temperature but wouldn't transmit the heat from the face of the chuck back into the resin parts here but honestly once you start going down that rabbit hole you might as well just spend all of that extra design effort and budget on just making these parts out of aluminum and you could have all of these parts machined out of aluminum there's nothing here that makes the part impossible to machine you know it's not the kind of part that has to be 3d printed there aren't any hidden galleries or anything so you could absolutely machine these parts if you have access to a machine shop or have them machined in fact most places that you would have these things three resin printed they also have a machining service it just costs more so you know that may be an option down the road if it turns out that these things can't take the heat um, we'll swap them out for aluminum parts and it'll it'll be fine on the front of the chuck you can see that the jaws are made of these flat armatures that have an m8 bolt sticking through the front here and then the bolt itself is sort of the arm that sits against the part that you're trying to hold so the um, so even though we're calling this whole thing sort of the jaw of the chuck the real jaw is this uh, this bolt that's sticking out and what I've chosen to do is to use a relatively small bolt and then to beef it up so that the diameter exceeds that of the armature by using these sort of thick washers. The diameter of these washers isn't critical, so you can use whatever washers that you can find to stack up on these bolts. And you can also use as long or as short a bolt as you want on this. My plan is to actually use pretty long bolts and then to sort of space the larger washers with smaller standoffs so that I get sort of like groups of washers as you go across. And what I'm gonna use that for is to actually wrap these jaws in some sort of glass fiber or rock wool. And then the space in between the washers will let me put a wire tie around that rock wool and sort of crank down on it to hold it in place. So I think that's gonna work out pretty well for me. We'll see. Um, obviously the fact that it's just a bolt sticking through here is gonna make it pretty adjustable. So there's all sorts of stuff we can play with there until we get it to actually work. Now what's gonna be most important on this chuck is getting all of these jaws correctly aligned so that when they close, they close concentric to the spindle. All of the chuck jaws are held onto their individual drive shafts just using, you know, these set screws. And so the idea is that, you know, we'll get our belt or whatever it is that's driving the three jaws uh, in place We'll get everything set up and then we'll loosen the grub screws and we'll be able to manually adjust these jaws. My plan is to do all of the adjustments at once. So I'm gonna put a piece of tubing or bar stock or something through both uh, spindles. So it'll go through the headstock and through the tailstock. And I'm gonna put some big elastic bands around the jaws of the chuck so that they will self-center that piece of stock. And then I'll sort of turn them and make sure that everything uh, turns concentric to the spindle. And if that uh, looks like it's happening, then that's where everything needs to be set. So then we'll go on the back Back side of each of the chucks and we'll just set all of those set screws so that now all of the chuck jaws are lined up the way they're supposed to be. Hopefully that, that scheme is gonna work for me. As you can see, I have this sort of center sled right here that sits on the linear rails. It also has linear bearings underneath that you can just sort of barely see here. Um, the idea for this is that it's going to be sort of a tool stand. So primarily what it's here for is to act as a heat shield for the ways. This is gonna be something that you can slide underneath wherever you're working so that you're not aiming the torch down at the ways and heating things up unnecessarily. It'll also act as a fire carriage, so I will be able to put a Bunsen burner on this. And then beyond that, there are some other things that I think I could do with this. So in theory, I could also have a graphite tool holder. This being sort of a universal tool stand, it'll have either a set of magnets or a bolt pattern or something. And I'll be able to sit a, a jig on top of this that'll have a graphite tool and a linear slide. And I'll be able to sort of pull that graphite tool back against a spinning envelope so that I can shape it. 
Another sneaky trick that I think I'll be able to do with the slave is because I have full computerized control over the feed of the tailstock, as well as the speed of the spindle, I can use that to actually make a coil winder. For instance, if I wanted to wind grids, wire grids, I could take a pair of stretched wire rods and 3D print a little holder that holds them parallel to each other in this chuck, and then I advance the feed on this until this is like sitting way out here. And then on this platform, I could have a spool of wire and a little tensioning arm. And then I could have a program that turns on the spindle and moves the tailstock back at a set speed to wind the wire in a set density. So I could use this to theoretically wind my own wire grids or even wind transformers or coils or all sorts of things. So um, I think that is, you know, kind of a stupid trick that the slave could, could theoretically do. Um, and I think there's probably more stuff like that that we'll find later on. In my rendering here, you can see that this whole thing is bolted down to a plank of wood. This plank of wood is really just here to represent the, the workbench that this whole thing is bolted down to. In reality, probably this whole thing is going to be bolted to one of those large utility carts with the wooden top that has lots of drawers that I could keep uh, torch heads and, and glass working tools and stuff in. And then I think actually my plan currently is to set all of this on top of a big slab of refractory brick and then bolt it down to the cart um, through the refractory brick using some uh, lag screws. Yeah, I think that pretty much covers the whole design, but if there's something that I forgot to talk about, you know, leave me a question in the comments. All right, let's go to the bench and I'll show you how much of this actually exists. This is the tailstock or the headstock. It doesn't matter because they're identical. Um, as you can tell, it looks exactly like it does in the CAD. In fact, that CAD file is what I sent to Oshkut, who fabricated this aluminum bracket. They did both the cutting and the bending. The only thing that I had to do when it got here was to finish the bends on either side because they would collide with the press brake as they were designed. And then I had to drill and ream all of the holes uh, because this was, uh, I believe, water jet cut. And uh, obviously you don't want to rely on the water jet to bring your uh, drill hits to final dimension. As you can see, the big beefy bearing blocks fit into the bracket uh, perfectly. Um, I have them in here with some 7 8 bolts. These things are massive uh, and I think it's going to hold together fine. Now, as you can see, there is some play. I can bend this bracket a little bit, um, but all of that should go away as soon as we have plates bolted to the top and sides, uh, and it should turn this into a box section and it should have plenty of rigidity. Um, my holes on the bottom line up perfectly with the linear bearings that I ordered, and uh, I believe that they will also line up perfectly with the stepper motor mounts. Let me grab one of those and that's gonna fit just perfectly in there. I can see from, from the top here, I can tell that the holes line up perfectly and it's gonna hold the motor right in line with the shaft here. As you can see, the bearings look a little wonky, but that is because they have sort of a self-centering um, mechanism and uh, all you have to do is put a pipe in there and crank it around and they will line up with each other. Speaking of pipe, this is the first pipe that I got to try to use as the spindle. Now this is a piece of stainless steel pipe and it is sold as uh, exhaust pipe. It's two inch outer diameter, nominal, and it is uh, welded and then the seam is ground. Now, even though it is very close to two inches outer diameter, it's not exactly. I mean, this is closer than it has any right to be, honestly, considering the way that it's constructed. I mean, this is not a piece of machine stock. This is a piece of pipe and it comes very close to fitting, but it just doesn't quite. And so I ended up not using this and I ordered a piece of two inch outer diameter aluminum. This is the aluminum pipe. Now, the aluminum is much lighter. It costs about the same as the steel, honestly. And being a piece of extruded pipe, the outside diameter is really well controlled. So it is exactly two inches outer diameter. And as you can see, it will fit perfectly inside these bearings. It is a snug fit. If I move this one out of the way, we can have a look at this. This is the other stock built up most of the way. The only thing missing here are the uh, side panels, the stepper motor, stepper motor bracket, and the belt to connect the stepper motor. But we have a spindle that spins. 
we have a chuck on the end of the spindle and we have a uh, belt pulley for the spindle and all of these things um, fit together just as, as I specified. I'm very happy with the construction and I think that this is actually gonna work. Um, there are a few problems that I have had to solve with the chuck and there are further problems that I think I still need to solve. Um, so let's have a look at the chuck. Here is the chuck. It is exactly as I designed it in the CAD, except for one change. You can see, instead of a belt and pulley to uh, connect all of the chuck jaws together, I've used number 25 roller chain. The belt, I believe, could be made to work. You would need a lot more tension on the belt, and I think you would need larger pulleys. As it stood, I just couldn't get enough purchase on the pulleys that I felt confident spinning this thing uh, because I was afraid that the centripetal force acting on the uh, chuck jaws would actually pull them away from the center of rotation. And if one of these things came loose from the belt and swung out like that, not only would it drop my part, which I'm not as worried about, but it would unbalance the whole machine and possibly, you know, damage the machine or injure me. So I want to be sure that these things aren't going to, you know, fly apart. So what I've done is I've put a piece of roller chain on there. Now the roller chain has engagement with, uh, uh, three or four teeth on this sprocket. I'm not at all worried that that's gonna slip. The next weakest link in the chain is probably the grub screw or the set screw in the sprocket that holds it to this piece of flat ground shaft. Here you can see that I'm using a worm screw arrangement to drive one of the jaws. And that allows me to use a tool on this shaft here to open and close the chuck jaws. That system works pretty well and I'll demonstrate now how the jaws open and close. Eventually I'll make a key for this, but um, in the meantime, I've just been driving it with this hand drill. You may have noticed that the chuck jaws are a little bit loosey-goosey, but that's only when they're not engaging with anything. You know, if you have them opened against something or closed against something, then you can build tension in the chain that actually holds this thing together. So I'm not too worried about that. What I am worried about is that when you actually try to grip something, there is this force acting on this shaft right here that tries to pull the spur gear away from the worm gear. You can imagine that as you're driving this worm gear and the end of the chuck jaw is encountering resistance, it's forcing this shaft out in this direction until finally the uh, spur gear skips a tooth on the worm gear and then you're no longer able to put any more tension on the chuck jaws. I originally thought that it would take quite a bit of force, I mean, more force than you would want to apply um, before you would start to see that skipping happen, but in fact, because of the materials used and because the shaft is only supported in one place uh, in the middle here, you actually see that happening a lot earlier than I would like. So what we're going to need to do is to add another plate to the back of the chuck to keep these shafts perpendicular to the faceplate and therefore keep the spur gear engaged with the worm gear. It'll also help avoid run out on the uh, arms of the chuck jaw because the more that these shafts can sort of bend this way, the more that you're going to see the tip of this move uh, out away from the center of rotation. So it solves a lot of problems for us and it's gonna be relatively easy to do. Let me show you sort of what I have in mind. If I take this plate that I had cut for the other chuck and I just place it on top of this chuck, you can kind of get an idea of what I'm trying to do. I've already designed a new collar and new shaft supports that will screw into this rear plate and create one big rigid assembly that will hopefully hold all of these shafts perpendicular to, this, to these plates. This also helps to just enclose the rear portion of the chuck so that things are less likely to get stuck in the chain or the um, worm gear or anything like that. So it's actually a nice safety upgrade and it'll increase the amount of spindle engagement that we get on the chuck. So um, all in all, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that solution. So I just need to have two more of these cuts so that I have enough to put two on each of the chuck assemblies. And then I also need to 3D print the new version of this uh, and these shaft supports.
Thank you so much for watching to the end of the video. I want to give a special shout out to all of the people whose names are on screen right now. Those are my triode level patrons. They throw me a couple bucks every month to support my work. And if you want to join them, you can go to patreon.com slash integrated therm, where you can sign up as either a diode or triode level patron. All patrons have access uh, to the videos before anybody else and triode level patrons get their names at the end of the video like you see here. If you liked the video, leave a like, and if you want to stay up to date with what's going on in the tube making series, then make sure to hit the subscribe button so you know when the next video drops. Both of those things feed the algorithm and make sure that this video ends up in front of all of the people who might be interested in this kind of work. Thanks again for watching, and I will see you all next time.